Um, I, you've mentioned that on a couple episodes here, um, yeah. talking about the metaverse and about tea in the metaverse. Well, we are um, we are in the metaverse right now as we speak. This is the metaverse, and it's it's interesting because you know this is live, this is visceral. We have a live audience who is having this live experience with us right now, but then also, you know, the there will be a. Um, an edited podcast experience that would then be discoverable and experienceable th through other platforms, um, you know, including Discord servers and, and email and, and other forms of social media. So, sure. Um, yeah, that's that's metaverse. This is T in the metaverse. We're making it happen, <laughs> Colin. We are futurists. I can call myself a futurist. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Speaking of tea, though, um, honestly, so we've got Longjing tonight, Dragon Well, whatever the hell you want to call it. Um, both of these came from Elise this time. Last time we did my teas, this time we're doing yours. Well, the teas that you sourced. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm excited to get into these. Uh, this is going to be a fun opportunity to just drink out of mugs, I think. <laughs> I don't yep. see any point in the big fancy teaware for, for just nice, good green tea like this. Yeah, well, you know, even in um, even in China, this, right. this style of tea, this is typically how it's consumed in, in a mug. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, in the Western world, it's been deemed uh, grandpa style. Um, and it's why, you know, when you travel in China, you will see several different um, hot water machines everywhere. And it's because people are carrying their tumbler. Uh, filled with their tea leaf. But typically, you know, uh, Longjing or Dragon Well is a very common tea used in that um, form of brewing. But you know, any any type of tea really can be. But Dragon Well is preferred because um, it's a green tea that's very hard to oversteep. Yes. It's a very gentle green tea, and we'll see that uh, tonight. So, the two different Longjings that we'll be trying tonight. One of them is coming from uh, Longwu Village, which is one of the original famous. Uh, you know, um, first origins of 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 Longjing of the um, the Westlake Dragon Well, the Westlake area. Westlake is a very famous touristed area um, in in, um, in in eastern China, uh, very near to Shanghai, only about like an hour train ride away. And, and Longwu is one of the the easiest towns to reach right there when you get off the train stop. Um, and then the other one is um, from a very different place uh, called Gansu, um, not famously conventionally uh, um, a production area for Longjing and kind of a coincidence of how um, I came across these producers and, and started to um, import this tea. It was actually through the UC Davis Global Tea Initiative back in 2000. 17 I believe was the year or 18 um, when uh, I, I gave a presentation there and part of the panel that I was on after my presentation um, another presenter was representing uh, not a tea organization or a tea manufacturer but mm -hmm. uh, an environmental nonprofit organization that had worked with the village that uh, produced this tea um, as a um, regenerative uh, environmental project in the village following a very large earthquake that had caused a lot of damage in the area um, and long Jing plants and cultivars had been planted there years before but um, you know and what we'll go into detail about the history of that and, and how this is all relevant but um, what they had discovered was that there would be a viable economic development opportunity following this earthquake if um, these producers were to do organic production because they weren't doing organic production prior to that um, to restore you know in the indigenous species and and, and the, the water and the, the soil vitality um, and then also focusing on more like handcrafted processing to mm -hmm. get a higher value for their products and bring more economic development to the area so Again, this is like a non-traditional, non-famous tea growing region. Um, and so it's kind of the best of both worlds because in the, the famous Westlake villages um, where that, that famous dragon well exists, um, the, um, 
the land is quite low elevation mm. um, and they deal with uh, great pest problems during the summertime, during the hot months. So it is extremely common for heavy pesticide use as well as whatever, you know, agricultural chemicals uh, to be used. So it's uh, actually quite difficult to find and access um, organic all natural tea um, in that area. A lot of a lot of chemicals being used there, and um, so it kind of sounds like for the Gansu, um, the they kind of got this almost beautiful reset button mm -hmm. in a terrible way, um, and beautiful for the land, not for the people, because holy shit, an earthquake is fucking terrible. Mm -hmm. um, but just this like interesting reset for the land uh from the way you're telling it but yeah i i so I, I was reading a little bit on your website um the listing of uh the one that you do have up which is gansu um and uh just noticed the what you had said about how it's non-traditional you know organic kind of processing um and i've only had longjing from uh the more traditional uh I, yeah, uh, from the more traditional uh, uh, location, but um, yeah, I don't know. I'm interested to see how this compares. So, yeah, yep. And then yes. another major difference between these two teas is the year of harvest. So that's uh, to note. And I don't know if I can you say that, that one more time. You had a motorcycle, I think. Go by. Yeah, yeah. My motorcycle in the back is revving up. Um, <laughs> the uh, <laughs> something important to note of difference between these two teas is the year of harvest. So the um, the Long Wu is from 2014, and the Gansu is from 2021. Um, so a significant difference, and I know in the sake of science, not the most ideal way uh, for us. Um, I can actually, I think I can see that age a little bit in the leaves course, too. I mean, yeah, there's yeah, a little yeah. bit more of browning almost to the, yep. the Long Wu. Yeah, so, you know, I know this is not going to be the most accurate uh, comparison side by side, um, but, you know, viewers at home or, you know, listeners are, 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 are not having the opportunity to taste these teas. And, and really when it comes to making these major differences, you do need to taste the tea. But the, the, for the purpose of this podcast, um, you know, telling the stories and talking about those differences is really what's going to bring value to the, mm -hmm. to the listeners. So, um, yeah. you know, when, when, when you suggested that we, we compare these, I, I was like, okay, it's not the most scientific way to do it but um it'll it'll be really great storytelling and we can we can talk about how you know the color looks different and um well maybe... and too i mean when we started this podcast when, when you and i met that first time one of the things that we did definitely discuss was that we don't want this to be a big you know laundry list of tasting notes and uh trying to you know identify all the unique flavors so i think that honestly it it's it's very fitting for the podcast to be more focused on the story behind these than the mm -hmm. you know the and and the terroir and stuff than potentially the exact same teas if you will so yeah 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 exactly cool so do you want to get started yeah and i'm thinking we just drop them both and and cool. let them both roll at the same yep. time yep yep cool 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 let's do it okay. so for the uh, gunsu i'm using my personal favorite mug I don't know if you can read that. The reason I swear so much is because, okay. Yep, I mm -hmm. can read it. <laughs> <laughs> now, for the sake of science, I am using the same exact mug for both. These are both, um, I think they're beer mugs, but, you know. I don't have any heat-resistant glass, so we're just going in with the regular porcelain mugs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, these are definitely very high-quality heat-resistant glass. Um, I have some frosted mugs in the freezer, but I don't think that that's a good idea. I think my favorite part about a uh, Dragon Well, Long Jing, whatever, is uh, uh, just the, the flat leaf, the long flat leaf. It's absolutely mm -hmm. gorgeous. Yeah, it really is. Um, I have several videos um, on our YouTube channel of that. I know we didn't set up for me to, to send you videos on this live stream, but um, uh, perhaps even in the um, 
editing of the video podcast if you're interested i can give you some links to those um it's re- it's really fascinating and like uh you know the 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 real artisan processing of of long jean tea you know that mm-hmm. differences i told you of the you know the village in gansu when they started doing the artisanal tea production uh there has been some machinery introduced to the production but the one thing that has remained consistent is that the final finishing step the final drying finishing step is done by hand it's done in small batches in a small walk um that that may be electrically heated you know all the ones that i saw were all electrically heated um versus the um the wood fire heated walks that you see with like the the shung tea processing in yunnan um but it's done in 100 gram batches so it's a pretty small batch Um, it's like a single order (laughs) Yeah, it's like a single order, um, and you know it. It may take uh, twelve to fifteen minutes for them to do the final, the final roasting, and they do it by hand in this small walk, um, and they'll just stay up all night, just doing batch after batch. But leading up to oh. that, there are other equipments used that do mechanize, kind of the sweeping and 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 kind of rolling process shaping process that that does flatten the leaf but what gives the leaf that final like glossy sheen is that final you know artisanal um small batch um roasting that happens by hand um you probably saw my face by the way i like poured the water and let it set for like half a second and it was just immediately like my nose was just yeah. attacked with no rope yeah. like aromas of like almond and chestnut and like yeah. sweet kind of things all right well i'm gonna go ahead and get started on mine um just really quickly i i think you can maybe you can't see my tray but you can see my cam here so um i'm gonna brew these just for fun's sake, uh, the way that the the Longwu tea producer taught me how to properly mm-hmm. uh, brew Longjing, just because it has a really good um, like uh, smelling, you know, aroma sensing sure. um, step to it. So um, you just add the hot water enough to just cover the leaves, just a small amount of water. And like that initial, just like, oh man, even, even the tea from 2014 is like, 2019? It was 2014. 2014. Was it? Oh. Yeah. The long was from 2014. Still packing strong aroma. Okay. So I'm, I've got a question for you on that. Yeah. Um, while we're kind of waiting for our leaves to sink. Um, yeah. You're the only person I've ever spoken to that's like, yeah, agent green tea it, that's that's more than a year old like um and i'm not it's not enough i just never see it and i'm very curious as to as to your opinions on on the freshness of green tea and whatnot yeah I, it's a controversial opinion it is and, it really is um the reason why i um i'm not ashamed to bring a tea like this to our podcast is because i do want to demystify a lot of this like I don't think that you're ever going to see a vendor selling you a 2014 Longjing and trying to convince you that it's like aged perfectly and it's increased in value because that's not true. But sure. what I do want to demystify is, you know, if you've got that old Dragon Well sitting in your cabinet and, you know, you're curious, can I drink it or not? Is it going to be good or not? Heck yeah. Like, why not? You know? And then- I mean, as long as it's not like spoiled, like it's you don't see mold or bugs on it. I don't see any reason why you can't drink it, regardless. Yeah. Like it, tea is tea, but I I know that for a lot of folks, they you know they say after, especially the folks that that store all their greens in a fridge, right? And I do yeah. that um, with my Japanese greens as well. Um, uh, they you know they store them in the fridge to keep them fresh and whatnot. Uh, and it's it's interesting to me because. Uh, I I've heard before that in in like China and in Japan that's not necessarily the n- general custom, but that could be wrong. I could be completely wrong. Mm-hmm. But 
yeah, they, they complain about losing the aromas and the flavors and stuff. Yeah, um, no, things but, are lost. It changes, and we'll see that. Sure. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that and see that when we, we try these two teas side by side. But um, I just, like, want to suggest to people to not be afraid of it um, and not to throw them out um, because, you know, I've, I've seen people that will actually throw their teas out out of fear of, like, you know, um, but yeah, you, you're not going to be seeing a vendor selling 2014, um, green tea and, and trying to convince sure. you. Um, but what you may start seeing because of the scarcity issues that are happening due to the pandemic and now due to everything else going on in the world, um, you may see some vendors starting to maybe introduce you know, or, or continue to sell teas that, you know, in the past, past would have, their date. yeah, would have been considered past their date. Um, you know, now just because the tea doesn't exist in the market, um, you know, they're kind of forced to extend the, the shelf life or the best buy date of, of some teas. So, um, mm. Yeah, don't be afraid of your older teas. You're definitely you're definitely going to see a change to them, but um and you know for the most part for all parts if if you've got mold or things growing on it, that's your fault. Like you did something. <laughs> you did something. And too, if you don't like it when it's older, that's fine, you know. Yeah. I'm not saying you have to like it either, just yeah. you know. My my only issue is when I get green tea of indeterminate year of indeterminate age. I'm like, well, okay, what am I supposed to expect at this point? Hmm. My leaves are starting to open up a little bit. I, so I, I, I do, uh, this, this style of brewing at work pretty much exclusively, um, just because, you know, there's not really enough time to be doing, uh, gung fu sessions while I'm trying to do my job. Uh -huh. Um, <laughs> So this is how I brew tea when I'm at work often. And um, something that's really enjoyable about it, I feel, is being able to kind of observe the leaves in action. Mm -hmm. And so I have a glass mug at work for that specifically. Yeah. But I mean, um, I truthfully, one of the most exciting parts of, of, of drinking tea in such a slow way is watching them unfurl, watching them open, watching them sink, and kind of mm -hmm. the, the liquor change color as well. Um, but I wish I had my glass mug. Yeah, yeah, that's what makes these uh, these glasses, you know, really exciting for, for watching the tea. You can see them. And, you know, the flattened leaf, there's not, like, a whole lot of unfurling with this style of, of rolled leaf. Um, but what is interesting, and what you may be able to see, is that the leaves, they kind of stand straight up. Mm. They stand straight up. And, you know, I've been told that whenever they're standing straight up as they're slowly going down is an indication of quality. Um, I don't know. I mean, when I was told that, it seemed to be kind of like some folklore, um, you know, of, of the tea standing to the emperor in respect or something like that, you know. Um, there's always some... On brand. Yeah, on brand, right. <laughs> there's always some kind of uh, magical story about why something's um, some way, but... It is very unique about about these styles of rolled leaves is that um, the the leaf does stand up and look very interesting. And honestly, and cool to watch. I wouldn't be surprised if that story was connected to this tea specifically just because of the history of the tea itself. I don't know a lot about it. I just know that it's considered a really famous tea. It's you know highly prized. I'm sure it was an emperor's tribute tea at some point, um, but. I, the thing that I always notice about Longjing specifically, and we kind of talked about this slightly before the podcast, but um, just is is how expensive the the style of tea is mm -hmm. in and of itself, you know. Yes. And and it's 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 one of the styles where because it's so popular, because it's so well known, you know, it's 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 easy to find, um, but it's not always easy to get good stuff, and you're going to probably pay for it, mm -hmm. and. I have had some Longjing previously that was, it was, it was okay, you know, um, but you really do have to pay for quality with some of this, and I feel like it makes it so inaccessible for a lot of folks, just the fact that you can't, 
mm. really get a lot of it very easily. Oh, that's good. I just took my first my first steep. Um, you know, people always ask like, when is the tea done? Um, as I said before, it's really hard to over steep long jing. Mm -hmm. So even if it's this is one of those teas that you you know set up at your office and you forget about it and you're like, oh shoot, I forgot my tea. Um, you can come back to it and you can just continue to add more hot water to it and it it just keeps giving for you. Um, but uh, I, I typically tell people like when the majority of the leaf has sunk to the bottom, because at first it will it will be float you you'll get those little floaties, um, but slowly. Oh, mine is time, refusing to sink. <laughs> um, mine is all all pretty much sunk already, which is nice. Yeah, I don't know. Mine if is it's refusing just to sink, like so I'm helping it out a little I used bit. or whatever. I've only got a few pieces that are still um, floating on the top. What I always notice is that it's the really buddy teas that float the most. Yeah. Yeah, and these are buddy. I mean, um, and, and both of these teas uh, were harvested uh, relatively early in the season. Mm -hmm. So that's going to also contribute to the uh, the bud quantity um, and, and the quality as well, the texture and the, the aroma, the freshness to it. Am I poking my leaves incessantly? Yes, 100%. This is a true mode of this style. <laughs> now, the my first impression, though, is that this 2014 Longjing, I mean, A, the liquor is darker, right? It's got a much warmer, almost toastier kind of profile to it. And there's almost like a cinnamon kind of bun note, mm. almost, that's kind of starting to introduce. Mm, I like that cinnamon bun. I get that, too. Yeah. I say that after going on this big rant about how we don't like a bunch of tasting notes laundry lists. <laughs> you know, I like those kinds of notes, though. Those yeah, kinds yeah. of notes that are more like memories and, uh, you know, <laughs> they're not like exact. Like, go look at a flavor wheel. You're not going to see cinnamon bun on there. Or what was the, the I... specific word you used, cinnabunny? You're not going to see that on a flavor wheel. You know, you said that because that was your feeling. That was your mm -hmm. intuition that just came out. And that's good. <laughs> So I go, this is actually a rant that I go on a lot in uh, Discord with friends, um, is when somebody says, hey, check out this, this flavor wheel I just found. Mm -hmm. um, I, I immediately go, go scream, <laughs> no. And, and it's kind of this, this joke with me now where, you know, I am constantly complaining about that. But truthfully, I, I, I did this when I worked in wine too. And I, I get, because the, the idea that you have to have all these nouns ready and on hand and like identifiable flavors, it, it really supports that kind of gatekeeping notion that, that there, there are correct flavors, that there are correct ways to taste. And that if you're not tasting them, you're, you must not be drinking it right. And that always bugs me because what I always tell people is, damn it, just tell me what you feel. Just tell me what you taste. Yeah. It doesn't have to be right. If it pops into your head, you probably tasted it or hinted at it. So yeah. just tell me, damn it. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's why that's why I liked that note. No, no shame on the cinnamon bun note. Um, okay, so I remember eating this tea from, you know, when we first went there. Because this was the tea that I brought back physically uh, when we went there in 2014. Um, it has lost its greenness, which for some people may be good because that like really strong asparag asparagus greenness um does kind of turn off some people they're um, wrong but whatever <laughs> um but for those folks that don't like vegetables um perhaps aged green teas <laughs> may be more fitting for you <laughs> than fresh ones um because yeah that vegetable that vegetable bite has been significantly reduced um, and it reminds become, me vaguely of like a, a hoji cha. Mm -hmm. Become nutty you know? and sweet versus mm -hmm. um, um, you know bright and and kind of bitey. And I wonder, you know, if part of me too wonders how how kind of the energies mellow, how the how the chemistry mellows inside as well alongside that, because I know that that's a huge thing that changes with age with teas that are traditionally aged. But I don't know. And the only the only downside I find to drinking tea in this style with the just out of a mug is that I feel like I don't necessarily get a full idea of, you know, kind of the, the psychoactivity of what's happening with my tea. Um, it's just a calming kind of drink at this point, which is fine. But 
I'm weirdly preferring the 2014 one though, and I'm a little bit annoyed with myself. Yeah. All right, I'll move on to the uh, the newer one. So yeah, the the color, the main color difference I can see on my screen. I don't know if people at home mm -hmm. can, can see this difference, but one's more brown, one's more kind of green. Oh, I can see that in my in my yeah. camera too. Mm. Yeah, definitely more vegetal. But again, the, the, the terroir is different too, right? Mm -hmm. So So how where can you give me a general idea of where these places are located in China? So you Gan said that Gansu is, is more inland. It's more north and more inland. Um, sure. and um, higher elevation? Yes. Yes, higher elevation, which is why the organic cultivation is a lot more possible. Um, right. You know, there there are higher elevation tea growing places around where the the famous Dragon Well area is, um, and you can find some organic production happening there. But in all of the main villages directly surrounding um, the West Lake, there's no organic stuff going on because it is so elevate uh, low elevation. But the area has just become so highly touristed and so highly regarded. Um, this tea is typically um, used as like a, uh, it's like a gift, but it's, it's, yeah. it's not a normal gift. It's like a corporate or political gifts. Well, I mean, like we said, it's an expensive tea, right? Well, that's why it's an expensive tea. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, the, 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 the region is famous, so that started to move the ball in the direction and that's how a lot of like the high priced teas in China started getting their prices and their value was because of the regard of the origin itself. But the, um, the, uh, the, the, the kind of, um, brand that was built around this specific type of tea being, um, you know, like a high valued gift that's really hard to come by and, um, really special is um you know something that's been practiced by politicians and, and and people in the corporate world um and so that's kind of created this competition in the price to go up and up and up and every year the tea just gets more and more expensive and you know the village that it comes from like longwu is one of the more famous longwu and meijiwu those were the two f first villages um those happen to also be like the two main tourist villages so, you know, probably some coincidence of, of that too, you know, people that just can travel there and access that versus, you know, places that are more isolated and far off, you typically can find lower prices. Um, I like the Disney World phenomenon of, well, you're here, so you're going to buy all this expensive food from Disney World. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, kind of, it's like that. It's very much has this like Disney vibe to it. The lake itself is gorgeous. It's enormous. Um, I've heard it's 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 i think it is the highest tourist destination in all of the country so people come from all over the country and tea is like the main product oh did you get some tea while you were there so um you know if you want to come back and you want to like uh, make good with your boss or if you want to bribe someone you know and there has been some efforts by the government to restrict the the the, the pricing you know wars that that come from that but it still happens. And so sure. um, what's happened over the decades is, you know, business in, ingenuity, in, ingenuity, ingenuity, I'm having trouble with my words. We got there. You got it. I got it. Um, they, they've taken the product and they've produced it in other places. So it's a lot cheaper to, to produce in other places. And so when you get your hands on more affordable longing, it's usually coming from provinces outside away um and so that's how such gansu, as the gansu yeah so that's how gansu got the tea in the first place and um you know if you go to taobao which is like china's version of of amazon you can find longjin and, and it'll even have the 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 shifu shifu means the west lake it'll it'll say you know like the authentic west lake dragon well and it'll be really cheap and um 
and you wonder how is it so cheap here you know when I went to there and, 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 and talked to the farmer it was a lot more expensive um, and it's because yeah they're they're doing mass production in, in other areas where the land is more accessible and um, and I, I, I we didn't do the comparison here but I will mention this uh, if if you are curious about how to differentiate that for yourself you know just for fun um, the and I have a YouTube video on this as well uh, of the the Longu producer because he was kind of frustrated because he's like I'm trying to sell on Taobao right now and I have to compete against all these fake you know teas trying to claim they're the same thing as mine um, and and he was like you can tell the difference look at the difference the the real authentic one that's made in those small batches mm -hmm. has more um, or ha lacks uniformity. It lacks variability in the color, variability in the, the color and the style of the leaf. And then he showed us, you know, the ones coming that were like mass produced. They're pristine. And they're all perfect. They're all perfect and pristine. So um, that's just something kind of clever and, and probably translates to other teas as well. Mm. If you want to, you know, kind of just look at that translates the, to. I was just say that translates to a lot of stuff mm -hmm. in life, honestly. You know, yeah. uh, teapots too. To be yeah. completely honest. Yeah, if it's too perfect, um, it more than likely was produced by a machine. So. Um, Damn, I'm really impressed with the 2014 green tea. Yeah, man. That's why I sent it to you. I was like, you know. Yeah. <laughs> And, you know, it's, again, like, you're not going to be seeing vendors, you know, pulling old teas out of the shelf and saying, oh, it's more valuable now. Um, They'd lose money, I mean. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the business of these teas is really difficult. This and Sencha, because, um, you know, d domestically there, there is such a high demand and a high turnover. Like, farmers know that there's going to be a local demand for speed to the market of these, like, early season green teas. Uh, in Japan, you've got the Shincha. And, you know, you, you try to bring those types of teas here to the market, here or in Europe or, you know, any other Western market. And that same appreciation doesn't exist. Um, so a lot of vendors get burned. You know, I, I can speak for myself. That happened to me. Um, I, unfortunately, with these teas, never sat on, on stocks. But I definitely have some stocks of, of Sencha that um you know i still have some retail packs of it and people will pick it up you know because they're like i'm just really curious about this tea and they still enjoy it and i'm like yeah you know it's not it's it's not the end of the world um but you know it does make business difficult because when they are fresh in early season domestically the the value is really high um so, you know, my advice to, to tea vendors that are, you know, new to the business or curious about, you know, or if they travel, you know, sometimes people will travel to China or travel to, to Japan. I mean, not right now, but, you know, in the past and they would get kind of swept away in that excitement themselves and they drop, you know, $5,000 to, to bring a batch of fresh tea home and it doesn't have the same value here that it has um, in those local markets. Um, you know, it's a it's a fascinating thing, but you know, like the the all the whole game has changed now within the past two years because of all of the supply chain issues and the scarcity issues. So, you know, I think a lot of the um, the conceptions pre preconceived conceptions that people have that oh, it has to be fresh for it to be good, um, you know, really kind of um, yeah, maybe going out the window soon. Um, when we realize, you know, it's not that, it's not that difficult. It's, it, the tea is still drinkable. It's, it's still a good tea. Um, and there's just not new fresh tea making its way over here or making its way over here at an affordable price. Right. Yeah. Things are still moving, but you know, at a much higher price. So it's funny that, that, um, you kind of mentioned that, uh, and that we talk about that because I, I just read a blog post and I've got it in front of me here um, the other day and it has an excerpt in it. Uh, I'm going to pronounce this incorrectly, so please help me. Um, from uh, Kaibara Eken, 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 I don't know. Uh, it was a Jap uh, an authority on Japanese herbs who lived during the 17th and early 18th century. Mm -hmm. um, he has a work called Yojokun 
Um, but the, the quote that he's, uh, he pulls, there are many people who now drink a lot of tea from dawn to dusk. Drinking a little tea after a meal helps digestion, quenches thirst. Uh, salt must not be added um, as it's bad for the kidney. One must not drink tea with an empty stomach. As, and it goes on like this. Um, people with weak constitutions must not drink that year's shincha at all. It will cause eye problems, anemia, and diarrhea. You should only drink shincha after the first month for people with, and it's just, it goes on like this for a bit, but it's just, it's, it's interesting to me because, um, it's specific, that specifically goes against what, what, what I've been told since learning about, you know, shincha, Japanese tea, and that you want it as fresh as possible. You refrigerate it so it stays that way. You never, you know, and, and all these kind of facts, and it's just, uh, I, I'm curious how that how that phenomenon came about. I guess. But. Yeah. Yeah, that is curious. When was that from? That was from the 19th century. From the 17th century. I'll send you the link to the blog okay. post. Um, I have personal reasons not to mention the blog. I didn't just. Okay, got it. <laughs> cool. But I'll uh, I'll send it to you. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that. I mean, yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah. You know that. Um... You know, even the the ideas and the thoughts around tea have changed over over history. Um, yeah, don't drink sincha. Um, yeah. Yeah, I you know I learned about tea in Japan, right? And sincha is huge there. Like that's like the big you know the big thing, and you know for a lot. So that's of why I brought because of your uh, <laughs> history with Japanese tea. <laughs> yeah, a lot of the. Um, the hype around Chincha is, is kind of paired with, again, tourism and mm -hmm. um, Golden Week, right? So Golden Week is like the one, you know, big holiday of the year. Everybody takes the week off and they all, um, you know, go visit family or they, they, they go with the family to go do something together or, you know, do a barbecue out in the, in the park or whatever. Um, and, and so Sincha was just kind of introduced as this activity or this gift uh, that went with it, this high regard gift. Because, um, you know, like compared to the rest of the supply of tea throughout the year, there's really not that much, not that much Sincha versus the rest of the tea that's consumed daily. So Sincha is like this novelty um, type of a thing. Um, but, you know, it can be five to six times more expensive than the tea that's harvested the following week, you know, just because... And they're the same tea. <laughs> it's the same exact tea. Yeah, it's true. Um, and, and, and something very similar with, with the, the, the early season, what's called a pre-Qingming. Qingming is mm. like the, the rain harvest. It's like the spring harvest or the spring festival in, 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 in China. Um, again, a lot of tourism and visiting the family. And um, so, you know, there is difference. You know, the, the leaves are smaller and, and a very discerned, you know, uh, connoisseur should be able to taste the difference and differentiate and, and tell, yes, this is genuinely coming from, um, you know, a late March, early a April harvest versus a late April harvest. But... Um, you know, if you're just looking for a really great green tea to drink, you know, I, I would recommend to, to overlook that hype and, and just find something that you genuinely do enjoy. Versus, so I, I, yeah. I've been starting to plan my, my spring orders before the, the spring harvest tea, uh, green teas, you know, get sold out or whatever. And I, I had been planning for months that I was going to, you know, um, have a sincha in the cart and everything. And over the past few weeks, I've kind of discovered that, yeah, what we just said, I mean, yeah, sure. I, my palate is not that. It, it can, it, it does not know that difference. And so I don't see any point in spending two or three times as much per gram um, personally for something like that. But, you know, it, it very much feels like a, listen, if you want to do that, you go ahead and do that. But mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. you live your best life, honey. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and, and even if you meet tea connoisseurs in China, they're not into that hype either. You know, that hype is mm. is really for a certain demographic of person. So, you know, like even if you're trying to become a connoisseur here stateside, you're going to you're going to get um, a similar connoisseur experience, you know, not 
you know, splurging on that early season tea. You know, it may be fun a couple times throughout your tea journey to do that, especially if you go to origin. Like, if you go to origin during those times. Oh, for sure. That's awesome. Yeah, like, That's totally, a bit different, though. <laughs> yeah, like, totally experience that. But, you know, like, importers that are, like, trying to rush to be the first ones in market here, they're trying to emulate that same hype here is it's it's not worth it it's yeah i would i would just recommend finding a green tea that you just enjoy and as you've discovered today there's one from 2014 that was quite nice so you know it's not really the freshness. i mean i one of my favorite green teas that is fresh is from autumn as well as an autumn harvest october harvest mm -hmm. uh and and that also you know very much goes against the grain of, of what's typical for green tea and it's and so i think the more that I've really drank green tea, you know, different kinds myself, and um, I won't make any concrete statements because I don't think that that's helpful in any regard. But from my personal standpoint, you know, it, it kind of boils down to the, it's, there's just a lot of, you know, kind of general hype just to get your money. It's not really that important. And I know we've kind of been saying that, but you know, I don't know. I'm getting a little like, tea loopy at this point i'm like getting into the getting pulled into the mug my my leaves still will not sink by the way interesting you know i find that like the leaves will like uh go up and down throughout mm. the session that's definitely true yeah but yeah no for the most part all of my leaves have have gone all completely down So yeah, the, the Gansu is, you know, the quality is probably not there, but the price, even though it is an early season and beautiful leaf, is like one-fifth the price. Uh, this The Longwu Dragon Well, after 2014, so the first year that we imported was 2013, um, and then we, we, we I physically went there the next year and, and bought again another batch and then the following year when we contacted them the price had doubled mm. the same exact tea and uh the the market demand was not there for it so you know i kind of abandoned dragon well because you know i wasn't gonna go to just some like commodity tea manufacturer which is typically you know when you when you see dragon well at an affordable price that's where it's coming from but um, in 2017, I believe, was when um, I met uh, I met the the man from the the nonprofit that introduced us to this village. Um, and even their prices are are going up. But that was their whole intention and goal was to start building a brand for this village and getting their 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 craft up. And you know, we we just sell such a minimal amount. I mean, for all of these like Chinese teas. When you see like a U.S. based vendor selling their teas, like we're not, we're not saving their business. Like they they don't need us. Like when we talk about you know these tea producers in India or Sri Lanka, um, yeah, the, the 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 international buyers are certainly paying a significantly more um, amount of money for the tea than than the local market. But um, for for Chinese tea producers, they are perfectly okay just selling domestically i think i read somewhere and again i fuck it was the internet so who the hell knows if it's true i mean 90 percent of statistics are made up on the spot let's be real um see but um the, i just it was a high percentage of uh tea that was grown in china i was shocked at the the percentage of tea that was grown in china is literally just for domestic consumption mm -hmm. um and the majority of that i i i noticed was green tea um it seemed and i've often wondered if i'm getting shit green tea from china <laughs> in the u.s uh mm -hmm. in comparison mm -hmm. um i've been told probably not but i have no idea regardless um but I often wonder what the what the difference in quality is because I know that for some folks uh, that you know similar to like 
you know, uh, places that have more fruit bearing trees, not like where I live, you know, you could go out and just get, you know, a banana from your backyard and that's fucking chill if it's in mm-hmm. season. Um, I've, I've, you know, read about, you know, the fact that a lot of people, they just, they just have tea from, you know, the, the local guy down the street that they know and he makes tea and that's fine. But yeah. yeah you know, it's uh it varies, it varies, but you know, if, um, I mean the main, the main factor for, for high quality teas is the price. If the price is nice, you know, the, you can ask some questions about, you know, well, where, where did this come from? Who manufactured it? Um, How did they manufacture it? Yeah. What's the plant material? Um, and, 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 and those vendors, you know, especially if it's like grocery store brand or something you're seeing in like a co-op or something like that, more than likely they're not going to have any of that information for you. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, I don't know. It's a, it's, it's a complicated question, but like the first thing that you can look at is the price and for, you know, high quality, good Chinese teas, you, you know, especially a tea like these, you know, I would say, if it's less than 50 cents a gram, definitely be asking questions. Um, you know, so if they're selling you a, a, a an ounce pouch for $12, um, you know, that's... Might be worth getting for the price and trying, but be aware of that. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, it's a tuition, as, as some folks say. But, yes, yeah. um, mm. good way of putting that. Yeah, 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 yeah. But just be smart and, and try to ask as many questions about where it comes from and build a relationship with the vendor. There are a handful of really great vendors of Chinese teas that are putting in the effort and work. Um, and the best ones are selling their teas for one to $2 a gram. Um, mm. And so that's how you know, okay, so they're, they're selling it at a higher price. Okay, that makes sense, okay. Um, but then, you know, there are a lot that are just, you know, finding like commercial, commercial grade um, tea and putting the fancy names on it, you know, and, and, and trying to, to follow in the hype. And um, you ultimately have to build your own palate and you build your own comfortability. Um, and, you know, even like relying on taste and texture, aroma, um, may not be enough because there's certainly tricks around it. In fact, I went to, um, when I, when I judged a tea brewing competition in Shanghai, it was sponsored by a very large tea company, commercial tea company, uh, that, that produces tea blends and tea products for very large brands, um, many famous brands here in the U S and, uh, state of the art facility lab. It was very cool to go visit and the um you know director of innovation did, did a speech for us and was really proud to to tell us that they had figured out the science of of replicating high quality tea through commercialization and that was through aroma mm. you know so um it's it's low hanging fruit, you know. It's sexy. Yeah. It's easy, you know. It's easy, easy to to spritz a little perfume on and, and make it seem like it's better than what it is. Um, so, you know, like if you really want to develop your own level of connoisseurship, I urge you. And I think I say this every single episode that we get together, Colin, um, is to get in tune with your own body's intuition and the energetics in your body, because that is one thing you absolutely cannot scientifically improve or you know um, fix uh, in a commercial sense like that's that's the love that's the intuition that's the gung fu uh, that how does it make you feel exactly exactly and it's a hard thing you know as you're yeah. you're new in your journey like you're not expected to know that right away and so yeah don't be ashamed if you like make a mistake and you buy some tea that turns into tuition um, but don't make the mistake of not remembering the experience of not improving upon that experience and, and improving your education based upon yeah. that experience as well. 
I, something that I, I always like to say, um, and so this is something that bugs me about sample sizes, mm -hmm. uh, sample packs, right? <laughs> when a vendor sends you a free sample and it's like a five gram sample, we're like, what the fuck am I supposed to do with that? Um, <laughs> and the reason for that is just because I find that a lot of teas that I initially think might be, uh, might be great, uh, can often turn into being tuition, right? Where if I brew, I brew it the second time and I find out, oh, no, 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 no. I just got lucky that first time or, oh, I just hadn't, you know, let that tea air out enough. And so there was this thing missing and that's more on, on flavor potentially, you know, but, um, I find that, how, you know, obviously how you brew the tea is going to make a huge difference, but, but remembering why the tea didn't work, remembering why, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't in tune with you or your body or, or whatnot is important. And what I, what I attempt to do is take notes, but that's, I'm very, very bad at that. And that's not for everybody, but I've got a whole spreadsheet with charts and graphs and I love it. Um, <laughs> but, 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 you know, I just, I try and remember, you know, like these things, but ultimately I, you know, just like sometimes if it's great, the first time it's not great. The second time it can be the opposite too. And, you know, regardless of anything, uh, I agree being in tune with your body is really important, but, you know, um, being open to experimentation, to discover, new new experiences as well is is really important too i think when it comes to tea but I'm getting rambly yeah maybe that's the tea the energy from the tea i mean there's it really is there's definitely a lot of energy in both of these teas um there's a there's a real warmth like through my chest region mm -hmm. honestly yeah both of them are balanced though both of them are good i mean even though this long wu is not organic and you know probably is not the cleanest of teas um it's still craft and it tastes fantastic yeah 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 it's a good tasting tea um so that's amazing Super. that's amazing that you preferred um this one over the fresher long um gansu um so yeah that explains that. that explains the the value and the price on it but you know is the the u.s market ready for that what i've learned no you know especially at the scale of business that that i'm trying to do of supplying tea to you know large scale business distribution, uh, it's it it really is a challenge and and really to be honest, like these these novelty terms, preaching Ming and um, small bud and uh, those types of things are are not really valued in the market, and I don't necessarily think they need to be valued in the market. I mean, perhaps in the future we could have um, you know a special line with very small quantity of these types of teas uh, accessible to uh, to buyers. But, you know, our buyers are looking for something that would be suited for, you know, larger scale distribution. Looking for stuff they can get a lot of and serve to a lot of people. And I think, so I think part of the thing that we're getting into as well here, part of this, conver what this conversation is hinting at, is something that we've discussed as well in the past is, and this is this is a frustration that I have. There are so many people that are willing to put in so much time and effort and knowledge and research and, and understanding into the brewing methods and the and the, the creation and, and whatnot of you know wine and beer and coffee and food and, and all this kind of stuff. But people uh, kind of that you know live in the in the Western Hemisphere, I guess, uh, often don't like to do that with tea. And if they do, they don't extend it past, you know, I've got this nice fancy teapot um, and I put the milk in first so I don't uh, break the mug. You know, like it's, it's like that's the thing. And that's fine. That's a very legitimate uh, 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 tradition of tea. But I this this desire to really care about that kind of shit and pay for and pay the money for what's worthwhile, you know, is is, is sometimes lost, I feel. And, and I feel like we've definitely discussed that before, but it's this willingness to to experiment with something that might not be so familiar, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll see more and more of it. You know, tea shops mm -hmm. starting to, to, to take it off um, and, and introduce this, this style to their customers. But again, it'll probably be a niche, you know. Mm -hmm. I, a lot of my clients are still in the age of, of trying to get their, their customers off of tea bags to loose leaf or from flavored teas or blended teas to, um, to pure teas. So Say, the, 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 the bag tea to loose tea is a rough transition because people don't like the inconvenience, but it's the fricking 
uh, 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 scented and, and flavored blends to the single origin teas that I feel really gets people. Oh, but this one tastes like orange peel and cinnamon. Yeah, because there's orange peel and cinnamon in it. This one tastes like orange peel and cinnamon in it because that's what the terroir gave it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I got a question on Reddit that I think yeah, is... Go for it. Well, not really a question, but just a statement that is kind of um, in line with what we're talking about. Munchy Bunches says um, that there's so many sellers in Japan that don't ship to the U.S. and um, they're not happy about that. Um, yeah, logistics on a retail level from Japan to the U.S. is just insane. It's um, hard. It's really difficult. And so a lot of companies choose not even to, to, to take on that challenge, let alone take on the challenge of being price competitive um, in order to succeed with that endeavor. Um, so, you know, that's why you don't see a lot of Japanese vendors uh, that, that sell abroad or have even distribution deals um abroad uh but um you know and that's why i started the company that i started because i wanted to facilitate that and bring economies of scale and make it more feasible for um you know for small scale producers uh to get their products here because there's certainly japanese brands that are getting their teas here but just like with the chinese manufacturers that we've talked about a lot of them are more commercial scale and the quality of their tea is not as good. Although, you know, with the Japanese culture of, of Kaizen, of always doing better, um, you know, there has been a really good um, replication of quality uh, on the commercial scale um, that, you know, is, is, is almost quite deceiving, um, specifically from the region of Kagoshima. Uh, which is very large land masses that, you know, do offer those economies of scale to get production costs down, the cost of the product is down, but they've somehow emulated the texture, the taste, and the aroma of the higher quality teas coming from regions such as uh, Shizuoka or, or Uji, where, where the, the value of the tea is higher. Uh, you love Kakushima uh. tea. Okay, cool. Yeah, Kagoshima, not all Kagoshima, but majority of Kagoshima tea is, is uh, what would be considered commercial commercial grade. I looked up a map of Japan because I'm not familiar with Japanese geography. Is this the like this, one of the southernmost provinces of the, or, or prefectures or regions or whatever they're called um, in Japan? Am I correct? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's very large. It is a lower yeah. elevation. Um, you know, the, the tea fields tend to be larger sprawling fields where they can do larger scale harvesting, um, not just with the, uh, the hand harvesters, but with, with actual, um, you know, trucks. Uh, more common to what you see in like US type agriculture. Mm. Yeah, it's in the South. And, and there are some mountainous areas, there are some artisanal you know farmers that are you know so that's why I, i've come to learn that you can't you can't you know say all of kagoshima but most of what you know makes its way here as kagoshima and actually a lot of the tea doesn't get labeled as kagoshima tea because it may be grown in kagoshima but the japanese government allows brands to label the origin of tea based upon where the final refining factory is located and so if the final refactory a lot of them are located in uji so you know they can source the leaf from all over the place and it all gets aggregated in uji and then which is the famous one right which is the famous yeah so uji cha is like you know highly regarded a lot of the uji cha that we see in the market is actually um not grown in uji uji is a a lot of tea is grown there but not nearly the amount of tea that's labeled as uji cha in the hmm. market mm -hmm. fascinating which is similar to this long jing that we've just discussed yeah yeah so this this happens all over the place it's a very yeah, yeah. common thing and that's that business that business mentality of like okay this is a finite resource that's highly valued let's let's try to expand this resource to you know expand the business opportunity and that's sure. how you get things um, such as, as Kagoshima. But yeah, um, my, my friends that deal in Japanese business, 
Japanese tea business, like the artisanal craft tea business, can can be quite frustrated with teas from Kagoshima because it's like really difficult to compete with. Like you know, with 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 this with the Longjing, like there are ways that you can educate your customer to see the difference and to understand and appreciate the value, but. With you know um, shinchas coming from Kagoshima that are like a fifth of the price than the one coming from from Uji or from Shizuoka could be really frustrating because it's like in a blind test could be almost impossible to differentiate. Mm -hmm. So that's that. Yeah, say so I think that's a that's probably a pretty good point there. I'm, I might need to go like touch grass or something. <laughs> yeah, right. I think I say that every week. I don't know what it is. Like, <laughs> we drink tea together, and I just get like so like rambly, and like I just like gotta go and like reconnect. <laughs> yeah, yeah, ground yourself again. It's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you know, we only get an hour to like pack in all of this information. Um, you know, and we could lot. go longer, but so I after like an hour you know it's like it's hard to it's hard to keep people's attention <laughs> yeah 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 no i think i think that's a good cutoff point um we got a lot of info in i mean i think us personally on a passion level like yeah we could talk about it um all night long um and that's usually what i do in my tea room here when people come in for tastings it just goes on for hours um but you know for the sake of of media here we've got a speaking of media mm -hmm. if you go to link tr.ee slash vodka underscore studio you can actually listen to this podcast we have episodes out um they're on youtube they're on stitcher no they're on stitcher they're on google podcast spotify apple a lot of places rss feed uh, podcast index so um make sure you go listen to it uh we, we've been enjoying making these i have been enjoying making these episodes i don't know about elise um, she probably hates me by now, but, um, <laughs> no, I don't, I don't know. This is good fun. Um, yeah, we took a couple of weeks off, um, which I think was probably good for us to, to get those, those evenings to relax or focus on other projects that we had. But, yeah. um, yeah, no, this, this podcast has been fun to create. Um, you know, I think got to do a little bit more work in, in getting the word out and getting more people to, to check it out. But yeah, you yeah, know, I need to step up my social media game again. I used to be really good at it. Oh, I'm quite good at it, but yeah, as, since you know this this new pursuit I've been doing, I, I'm just like exhausted on on all kinds of media outside of this this mobile streaming app that I've been playing on. Um, yeah. So it's been it's been a challenge to find the energy to to make posts and whatnot. But um, yeah, I gotta get gotta get back to it. We gotta get more people listening to this podcast. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Elise. It's always it's a pleasure to join you. You too. Thank you, Colin. Thank, thanks to Elise's chats as well. Yep. And, uh, yeah, I'll catch you next time, okay? Bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was fun. Yeah, You Know Me is a, um, is a, uh, is a good personal friend of mine, somebody that I um, had first studied tea with in Japan uh, when I first started um, studying tea and working in tea but um, I'm putting a link into the reddit chat I run a company very similar to you know me here in the states that facilitates direct trade between independent growers all over the world not just in Japan although um, you know, we do work with several different growers in Japan. Um, and yeah, we also do uh, list all of the, the harvest information, the grower information, cultivar information, um, you know, as well as, you know, telling their story and helping to, to build that connection between the producer and the consumer. Uh, but most, most of our business, as is with uh, You Know Me, a lot of our business is wholesale because we're really just trying to hit that, those economies of scale. And um, yeah, so with that said, uh, we just had a big group of people rolling through Reddit. Um, Y'all, my name is Elise. It is such a pleasure to meet you. I appreciate you stopping by my tea table. We just completed, um, 
a live podcast comparing two different dragon will teas from China, uh, from two different years, from two different regions. Uh, this broadcast or this podcast is called the First Steep. Uh, we are several episodes deep into this podcast. Uh, you can see uh, several of the episodes that have already been um, uploaded to various podcast and, and, and video um, platforms. If you go to this link, uh, linktree uh, slash vodka underscore studio, um, and we've, we've visited tea growing regions from all over the world and we tasted all kinds of teas. Uh, but we, we, the, the concept of the podcast is that we try two different teas in parallel and uh, we talk about terroir and we talk about you know how we can better understand tea um, you know not only through it, its marketing name but also through I put the link wrong see link tree it's not so easy to remember here disregard that first link this the second link works so you can go there and you can see all past episodes I will also post this to the Twitch, YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, um, chat. So yeah, please go check out our, our, our podcast there. We have several uh, edited episodes. Uh, what we do here on the stream is the, the live episodes, which we um, do uh, every uh, Monday night. So yes, please come back. Give me a follow if you'd like to, to check out another one of these episodes in the future. Um, again, my name is Elise. I am so happy that I've met all of you tonight, and we'll see you on the next stream.